Well, if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 17. We're going to read today verses 18 and 19. So we are here in our series of messages in John 17. We, we did some before uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, and now we're back. Uh, last week we were in verses 14 through 17. We talked about sanctifying truth today, 18 and 19. And we come to the end of a section in this prayer because in verse 20, which we'll uh, pick up in a couple of weeks, we'll see Jesus focuses on not the disciples, but those who would believe on him by their word. So he's going to pray for us. That's going to be fun to preach. He's praying for us. Now, of course, we apply the, you know, this prayer to ourselves as well. Some of the things you know, are different than, but some of them, I mean, just come right out of the box and hit us in the face you know, as we listen to him praying for his disciples. So we've been in, uh, you know, the first three verses about the agency of God. Then we looked at the glory of God and the word of God. And he enters into this prayer for his disciples. And he's not praying for the world, but he's praying for his disciples. And last week, sanctifying truth. This week, we're going to talk about the purpose, being sent out. So let me ask you a question. Do you leave the most important thing on your list until last? Or perhaps you say something like this, I'm saving room for dessert. I'm pretty sure I said that this week. I'm saving room for dessert. Well, why do we say that? Well, because the sweet treat at the end of a meal is sort of the climax to all the good flavors we've enjoyed in the meal. Or, if it's been a bad meal, maybe it's the saving grace of the meal, you know. So we save room for dessert. That's the way we might put it. Jesus prayed to the Father about the disciples. And here in 18 and 19, we have their purpose after the resurrection described. Saving, I I would say, the best for last. He framed it in language that made this purpose special. Jesus said that it was just like the Father sending him into the world. So let me read our passage, beginning there in verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So you notice verse 18 there. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Why did God send Jesus? That's the question, I think, that we need to ask here as we consider this passage of Scripture. Why did God send Jesus into the world? So to understand this, we need to understand this why question. And John, he does not hide the answer from us, not in the least. But he he weaves it into almost every chapter in his gospel. So let's just look at a few of these statements, these sent statements that we have in John's gospel. Now I'm just going to pick a few. First one is John 3, 16 and 17. Well, We know that one well, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he gave and sent for one purpose, that whoever believes in him should not perish, that they might be saved. Those are the things that God sent Jesus into the world for. Now, this is one, just one of the many times that John uses this word sent, and Jesus actually is saying this to his disciples and to Nicodemus, who he's talking to there in John chapter 3. But he sends us into the world kind of for the same thing. Now, we're not going to you know, be the one to die for the world so that they might be saved, but we're the ones to go now and take this message to the, to the world, this good news that they too can be saved. Why did God send Jesus? Well, that's number one, salvation. Number two, 
is found in John chapter 4, verse 34. He's talking to the lady at the well. You remember that story? And he says unto his disciples there, after the lady goes away and she's gone to get everybody from the, from the town and bring them down to meet Jesus. <laughs> and his disciples are there. And after she leaves, he's, they speak to him. And they say, oh, master, eat something. We brought you some lunch. And, and then Jesus says this in verse 34. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So why did the Lord send Jesus? So that he might do his will and finish his work. Now Jesus is going to send us because he says there in 18, you've sent me into the world, even so I've also sent them into the world. Our job is the same, to do his will and to do his work. Now it's not quite the same as what Jesus was doing, But in a like manner, he sends us to do his will and work as well. Next one is in John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus, and you'll you'll remember that passage that has in John chapter 6, he feeds the multitude there. And then there's the discussion about the bread and 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 the wine, which is flesh and blood. And then in verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. Because they'd ask him, tell us what the work of God is, and we'll do it. And he says, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Whom he hath sent. God sent Jesus in the world so that the world might believe on him. And that is God's work. John chapter 9, verse 4, one of my favorite passages in John. Now, I know I say that a lot, but I really love John chapter 9. The story of the blind man. There in verse 4, Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Notice what Jesus says there in verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. I am the light of the world. He sends us now not to be the light of the world, but to shed abroad that light because we know Jesus We now can share light. And isn't it wonderful, and I love the way John writes, he puts this this idea of Jesus being the light of the world in the story of the man born blind, who could never see light, but yet did see light. Now, I'm going to stop there because time would fail us to go through every single one of these sent statements that Jesus uses in John's gospel. He paved the floor of his gospel with this word sent. It is, ladies and gentlemen, everywhere. It appears in almost every chapter of the gospel. And in most chapters, it occurs multiple times. We have it in chapter 1. Then we have it in chapter 3. And I think 3 through maybe 3 through 17, we just, it's all over the place. And then we have it one last time in chapter 18, and then that's it. And then, of course, we have, we have it later on in, tw- I think, 20 or 21 also we have it. But so John just, it's everywhere. So after reading John's account, uh, you get to uh, 1824, and we read this. Now, Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. This is the last time in the gospel that John uses this word sent. But this time it's Annas sending Jesus to Caiaphas, bound. Well, the immediate response is that Annas could never have sent him bound unless the Father had sent him in love. This word sent is just everywhere. And Jesus says there in in verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also have sent them. Now, the next question is, why the world? Now, we've seen this word So much here in chapter 17 that our eyes almost glaze over a little bit when we read world again. We're like, okay, well, which one is this? You know, is this the created order? Is this the, is this the wild sea of humanity that's raging or is this the world in its corrupt order? Uh, Well, we've touched on it a little bit and we're going to see here again, this idea of world. He's, he's sending them into the world just as the father sent him into the world. Why? Well, because the world has a problem. I don't know if you like Marvel movies or not, uh, but one of my favorite little quotes from one of the Avenger films, 
is uh, the character, the Hulk, falls through the roof of an old warehouse, and he changes back into Dr. David Banner. And there's an old uh, security guard in the warehouse, and he sees the whole thing happen, right? And, and he walks up to Dr. Banner, and he says, are you an alien? And Dr. Banner says, no. And the old, uh, the old uh, security guard says, well then, son, you've got a condition. Well, that's one of my favorite lines. And he says it so straight-faced, just deadpan. Well then, son, you've got a condition. The world has a condition. Ephesians chapter 2. I quoted this last week. Please forgive me. I've been thinking a lot about Ephesians lately, and it just came to mind again. Paul writes there in Ephesians 2, beginning there in verse 3, wherein in time past... Ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. This passage describes both the world system as it is and the wild raging sea of humanity who are bound for God's wrath. Children of wrath, that means we are bound for the wrath of God. We are now under the wrath of God. As Jesus tells us in John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Already under the condemnation and wrath of God, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. Condemnation has already happened. Men are the children of wrath. So why does he send Jesus into the world? Why does Jesus send the disciples into the world? Because the world has a condition. And that condition is lostness. They are children of wrath. But God has a remedy. John 3.17, we just read it a moment ago. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Salvation from sin is possible. Rescue from the raging sea of lust and desire of the flesh and of the mind can be found only in Jesus Christ. He does not condemn the world because he doesn't need to. The world has already condemned itself. The Father sent Jesus into the world that they might believe and receive everlasting life. And of course, all of us here who are in Christ, we've gathered together because we come to worship our Savior and His Father. And we come in here in the unity of the Spirit to do so because we have been called out and saved from the world system. The world has a condition. God has the remedy. And it is available today, April the 14th, 2024 for all who will receive it. But why are we sent? Why is it that we're sent? That the disciples, we know why Jesus is sent. We understand that, but why, why now does he send us in like manner? I'm going to go back to John chapter 9, as I said, one of my favorite stories in John's gospel. And there in John chapter 9, in verses 7 and 8, we read about the blind man, and, and Jesus has spoken to the disciples, and then he makes some mud, and he puts it on the blind man's eyes. And he says to him there in verse 7, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, when, and they which had before seen him, that he was blind said, is not this he that sat and begged? You see, we are sent to bear witness to the wonderful work of God in us. He sends us to the scent pool so that we might wash, so that he might send us again. He sends us to the scent pool so that we can be sent. And so as soon as we go to the scent pool and we wash and we come again, everyone says, wait a minute, what happened to you? What happened to you? What happened to the blind man? What happened to the guy that used to sit and beg? That's who we know you as, but something has changed. There's been some kind of transformation that's happened to you. What is it, by the way? 
Dear friend, your neighbors are asking the same question about you. They see what you were, and then when you come to Christ, they see what you are, and they're like, wait a minute, this isn't the same person any longer. Who are you? Tell us who it is that you are. Yeah, so being sent as witnesses to bear witness to the wonderful work of God with us, we become a trophy on display in the Father's case for all to see. Jesus just didn't send the blind man to the pool so that he could see. I mean, yeah, that was wonderful, but he sent the blind man to the pool so that other people might see. And he witnesses to his neighbors and he witnesses to the people in the synagogue, all of whom refuse to see. But he can. And then he comes back and he finds Jesus. And Jesus says, do you believe in the, in the Son of God? And he says, who is he, sir? And he says, I, I am the one. I, the one you see before you. That's the one. Let me go back and read John chapter 9 so I can get my, my words straight. But you can do that at your leisure. So we're sent to the scent pool so that we can be sent. And then also we're sent to the sin pool so that we can be ambassadors for Christ. John chapter 13, uh, verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. This is Jesus speaking. Let me say it again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. My goodness, there's sin all over this passage. Once we are in Christ Jesus, adopted into the Father's family, redeemed and forgiven, then we become his representatives. We become his ambassadors. God uses this, or Paul rather, uses this very language in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So our job now is not only to be the display of God's grace to the world, but also specifically to be his ambassadors to the world. This couple that we just saw this morning on the video who are in Las Vegas, Nevada, preaching the gospel, they are Christ's ambassadors to Las Vegas. Now, I don't know where they all came from. I know his wife mentioned Alabama, whatever. But it's not a place on this earth that they're sent from. It is heaven itself that they're sent from to do the will of the Father in that place. To preach about the light of the gospel in that place. And all that Jesus has provided for them in that place. They become his ambassadors. And it is no different. We collect Annie Armstrong gifts so that we might help those people go. But folks, we too, here in Sharonville or wherever it is, whatever little community is we live in, here in the greater Cincinnati area, we are ambassadors in those communities. He has sent us. Heaven itself has sent us as ambassadors to those places. So that the light of the gospel might be shared. And as ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, this is why church discipline is so important. Because once we name the name of Christ over us and embrace our role as his ambassador, we must guard his reputation so that we don't slander him in the eyes of the world. A good example of this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul talks about church discipline with a man who is a member of the church but who is living a very immoral life. We must guard ourselves and the reputation of Christ. It's so important. That's why the world mocks when they see someone high profile or, or otherwise um, fall into sin. And they say, well, it, it, it's really, it doesn't mean anything, then does it? We must be careful. That's why church discipline is so significant. Now, he uses another word besides sent here, which is also very important, and that is found in verse 19. He says, For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. What was Jesus sanctified for? Or maybe we could ask it this way. What was Jesus sanctifying himself for? He says there in 19, For their sakes I sanctify myself. Did Jesus need to sanctify himself? He's our, he is God's son. He's sinless. He's holy. 
What he means here is that word sanctify just means to set something aside for, you know, one use and one use only. And I've told you the illustration about my, in, in my youth, my, my childhood, my father's chamois that he kept in the garage, and it was just for drying off the car. It was beautiful, that, that leather chamois that he had there in the garage. And he kept it in a certain place. And it was only to dry off the car. Well, guess what David did? I decided I needed a rag one day. I was out in the garage and I looked up and saw that chamois and I thought, boy, that'd make a great rag. And I used it for a rag and then dad came home. I never used it for a rag again because dad had sanctified that for one use and one use only. Jesus is sanctifying himself. He says that here. I sanctify myself. Well, what is it that he has set himself apart for here? The same thing the Father had sent him to do, to go to the cross. He set himself apart for the work of the cross so that he might sanctify the disciples as they go and do their work. Here we come back to the hour again. Remember we began with the hour? Father, now I've come to the hour. Well, here it is again, sanctifying himself. He says, I'm going to the cross, so I'm ready. I'm prepared. That's the only thing I'm going to do next is go to the cross. He's prepared to go to the cross and suffer for the sake of the men who trusted in him and for all those who would believe on him through their word. This, uh, um, George Beasley Murray in his commentary, the word biblical commentary says this, I love this. He says, this self-consecration of Jesus to death brings his mission of mediating the saving sovereignty to the world to its climax. He's going to sanctify himself so that the world might know God, the Father God. And then he said, Hebrews chapter 10, the Hebrew writer puts it this way. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Sanctified. By the offering of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus sanctified himself that they also might be sanctified. Set apart for one use. We then are sanctified or consecrated for a single purpose. We're told why in this second phrase there in verse 19 that they also might be sanctified through the truth. We're not sanctified or set apart on the same scale as Christ. We can't be because only the cross was his to enter into. We can't do that work. But, ladies and gentlemen, we are called to take up our cross daily, aren't we? Aren't we sanctified for that work? We are called to be his ambassadors. He sanctifies us for that work. We are called... Though once blind men, now on as a display of God's grace for all to see. We are a contradiction to the world. And he calls us to that. He sets us apart for that very thing. Do not be conformed to the world. Walk away from conforming yourself to the world. You don't need to be like that any longer. You're transformed now. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Live as a new creature. Walk according to his way. Psalm 119, the psalmist says there, he says, I will run according to the way of your commandments. Ladies and gentlemen, put your gym shoes on and go for a run. And run until the last day that you're here. Run in the way of his commandments. He has sanctified us to do just that. And then he says there at the end that they also might be sanctified, and notice this last phrase of this last piece here, through the truth. What is truth? Well, we just had that last week, didn't we? Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We had it in 17, now we have it again in 19. So what is truth? It is the word of God. We cannot do our consecrated work in the world without God's word. Can't do it. The grace of God that predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, ladies and gentlemen, is also a part of that truth. 
the gospel message that him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you've taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Those are Peter's words there in Acts chapter 2. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the truth. He has set us apart to carry our cross, to walk in the word, to experience to be examples of God's grace and to proclaim the gospel message. Jesus died for sinners and God raised him from the dead on the third day because it was not possible that the chains of death should keep him there. And for all the rest of the reasons that we just talked about there in the very beginning of the sermon, he, that God has sent him into the world to you know, bring salvation to the world, to bring light to the world, to finish God's work, that men and women might believe on him. Yeah, these are all the things, these are all the truths that he consecrates us or sanctifies us to live and to proclaim. So, how do we apply this, these two verses? First thing is, God has a remedy for the condition of men and women in the world, and it is found only in Christ Jesus. God sent him to do his will and to finish his work. It is only in him that mercy and truth meet together and that righteousness and peace kiss each other. Secondly, if we are in Christ Jesus, we are his representatives, and the church is his body and he is our head. We must remember to represent him well, to run in the way of his commandments. The church is not a playground where all behaviors are affirmed and celebrated. We are to be disciples, disciplined and running in the way of his precepts. And thirdly, we are to share the light of Christ with the world. That is the church's first and highest calling. And to that end, we are to bring, to bear our treasure, our energy, and our lives. We only have this moment. This is all we were given. Only this generation, only this lifetime, to serve our Lord and to publish his good news.